So tonight's topic, though, uh, this fluid identities, the Gila River watershed from uh, 500 to 1450 uh, is going to address, obviously, that stretch of time. It's going to, it's, I consider it to be a, a background for the public lands of the uh, greater Gila area. And we do a lot of work related to public lands and the, they're ideal places for learning, recreating, uh, relaxing, contemplating. Um, they're mostly available uh, without even opening your wallet. Uh, you can visit them uh, at, at very low cost. But just where do public lands derive from? What, first off, from they're actually derived from the, the uh, property clause, clause of the U.S. Constitution. So they're actually built into our federal uh, constitutional system of government. And second, almost all of the public lands have actually been carved out from tribal lands of native peoples uh, who formerly lived on those lands. And that's a theme that will follow up uh, multiple times uh, today. So Archaeology Southwest invests a lot of effort in working uh, <clears throat> related to our uh, public lands, particularly adv advocacy at, um, elements that we're involved in today. So just a quick, this is the entire uh, Southwest showing uh, national monuments and national parks. We're actively engaged in education related to the Bears Ears area in southeastern Utah and advocacy trying to restore the full uh, national monument of 1.35 million acres uh, up there in southeastern Utah. The next issue of our quarterly Ar Archaeology Southwest magazine is going to be on the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, another one that was downsized. Uh, we'll advocate for the uh, <coughs> re-expansion of that as well and share some of the remarkable treasures of, of that uh, national monument. And over in northwestern New Mexico, uh, Paul Reed in particular, uh, who's uh, our employee up in the, who now lives in, in uh, Taos, is working on uh, trying to protect the greater, greater Chaco uh, landscape from threats related to uh, leasing and, and exploitation of oil and gas up in that area. So, but tonight we'll focus on <clears throat> the watershed of the greater Gila. I want to talk about our advocacy efforts with tribes, the partnership that we, we have uh, with them, and to put that watershed into context, I want to share um, the work that we did just a week ago here in Phoenix of bringing together a set of 28 archaeologists and eight tribal people to consider um, what's the uh, history of this place over that uh, thousand year span that, that uh, is in the title here. So you'll get to see a uh, what I consider to be a very creative way to do synthetic research by pulling together a group of archaeologists, getting them to focus on a, on a single topic. And uh, there's some aspects of sort of the making of sausage um, that will be part of that um, discussion as well. But uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's worked to be a, a very creative uh, approach. And... So here's the, the watershed, Phoenix and Tucson, the big cities um, in, in the watershed. Some of the public lands advocacy that we're working on right now are a Great Bend of the Gila National Monument proposal. Uh, you can see it in the green on here, which it, it, it starts in the upper right corner, uh, just a little bit downstream from Buckeye, runs down through Gila Bend and would end at the lower left there, roughly at um, Dateland, if you're, you've uh, headed out towards Yuma or, or San Diego. About 80 miles long and about 84,000 acres uh, of uh, 
land remarkable petroglyphs and, and so on out there. We've worked very closely with, uh, there's 13 tribes at least who have identified the interests in that area and we've worked with 11 of those tribes. Uh, this is the press conference that was held back in two years ago when, when uh, the study of the tribal uh, ties to that area were, were uh, released uh, in Phoenix with Congressman Grijalva, who's uh, the lead player on the uh, legislation that uh, is promoting the Great Bend of the Gila. So that, that sharing of, of effort and advocacy by both archeologists and tribes working together has been uh, productive uh, and we hope to see that introduced again in the very near future with the hope that it actually may <clears throat> pass in the next time it gets into to, to Congress. I also want to though call out a an aspect of the work that we as, do as archaeologists um, that is can sometimes be uh, a, an issue for the way we work and talk about things uh, can be problematic to tribes. In our issue of the uh, Archaeology Southwest magazine that focused on Phoenix underground, all the work that's been done here in the Phoenix area, uh, one of the discussion topics was the issue of uh, Salado in the Phoenix area. And <clears throat> I'll just read the um, Barnaby Lewis is, Barnaby is the, the uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the uh, Gila River Indian community. And his comment on the right side of that, those columns there, this overemphasis on Cayenta migration as a causal mechanism distorts perceptions of prehistory. And these misconceptions continue to negatively impact the four Southern tribes. Research of this nature necessarily perpetuates questions regarding the direct relationship between modern autumn communities and their classic period Huagam ancestors. So basically he's saying that the kinds of research that uh, archeologists are talking about is disenfranchising them from uh, what they see as, as their ancestry. So we'll come back to that issue as we go through this as well. So, this, this strategy of getting experts together to try to do a synthetic uh, approach to the archaeology of an era, area, area excuse me, um, was first implemented by us up in Bluff, Utah. So back in the summer of 2017, so Bears Ears National Monument was established in December of 2016. And uh, when the Trump administration um, got underway in, the, in 2017, it was clear that they were looking to downsize that monument. So in the summer of 2017, uh, we got a group together to go through and consider the <clears throat> cultural landscape and its dynamic uh, sort of development over time that is represented within that Bears Ears National Monument. So these 30 archeologists, we gave them pretty much a blank map like this to start with. Uh, they were all arrayed in a room with, and everyone was looking at a common screen, um, as you saw in, in the photograph there. And in the course of about three and a half hours, we went through time and they were asked to let's take the knowledge that's in the various uh, minds of, of all the experts in this room and talk through where is population intensity or density greatest at, on that landscape and by time period. So we worked all that out. Um, and I'm just gonna go quickly through this series here. And the, the goal is to just perceive how dynamic that landscape is, how people move around, that they're in different places at different times. So the early time period there was focused in the highlands. Uh, early farmers in the area have moved farther south. Those red areas are indicating a higher 
uh, intensity of, of uh, people living there. There's kind of a shift to the east in the next era. Things get very thin uh, on the, the landscape after that. Uh, a little bit of a comeback in the next era. Very low intensity uh, use of the, of the area, um, between 900 and 1,000. And then it picks up again after 1,000. And then we start to see the final remnants of the agricultural population there in 1290. And then the base place basically empties out of um, agriculturalists at that point. So the key thing here is that there's this dynamic cultural landscape and if any kind of downsizing, and it was ultimately downsized from 1.35 million acres down to uh, just <clears throat> about 200,000 uh, acres. So has cut out key elements of that uh, dynamic landscape. So it's, it's no longer telling the stories that, that the monument was intended to. Um, so, <clears throat> Switching now, we're coming back to Arizona. Um, and so this is a fairly common way for archaeologists to uh, characterize on a map the kinds of patterns that we see on the landscape and named cultures. So for the Gila in the upper portion, the Mogollon in the central portion, the, the Hoacom, and then the lower uh, to the west there, uh, Patayan. So this is a pretty um, gross um, scale kind of way of viewing things. And it is ignores a lot of the uh, regional variability. Um, and it's our intent in the, the uh, gathering of, of people uh, last week was to try to look at areas that emerged over time where large scale inclusive uh, ideologies are reflected on that uh, landscape and how they uh, changed over time. So the ebb and flow of these large scale uh, inclusive uh, ideal identities was the, a key focus. And there's an environmental component of that. So the muggy owner up in high, um, higher elevation. Uh, their farming approaches and techniques are, are different than the Hoacom, which were uh, down in sort of the, the lush portion of the uh, Sonoran Desert, and uh, but where irrigation is, is pretty much an essential approach to things. And the Patayan on the lower Gila and lower Colorado, where uh, usually it's um, the floods of the, the river as opposed to irrigation uh, systems are uh, the agricultural practices there. So a, some big scale um, differences on, on the landscape uh, are actually environmental in terms of what are what people are uh, focusing their way of life on. And we'll we'll use the term worlds um, where the Hohokam ball court world, for example, um, is a, a time period when um, ball courts extend across a, a, a large landscape on the uh, along the Gila, um, a later platform mound world. And just so people are familiar uh, with, this is an example of a ball court there toward the right side of that, um, that image there. This is at Adamsville, um, just a little bit east of, of Coolidge on the, on the Gila River. And then a platform mound, this is the so-called compound B at Casa Grande Ruins National Monument. And those raised areas are literally uh, very substantial adobe exterior walls uh, that, and then, that are then filled with uh, soil and earth to, to create about a 10 or 12 foot high uh, new surface on which additional uh, rooms. Early on, they were probably ceremonial rooms. Uh, later on, they may have been residential. But that, those, that's a platform on that you're seeing in the middle. And the, the enclosing wall around the whole thing is a, an adobe compound wall. So this is a fairly standard form of, of uh, architecture in during the, the Hoacom platform mound world in that era. So we'll come back to, to these things. Um, but 
wanted to define those. So we'll be mapping things on this large scale, but always people were all were interactive with near neighbors. So there's these local um, valley scale or uh, smaller scale uh, local communities that are active over time as well. So those are always happening, but it's the larger scale inclusive uh, aspects of identity and presumably ideology behind that that uh, spread out and pulled together people on a much larger scale. And I <clears throat> want to run you through how our team of experts last Tuesday, just a week ago today. So what you're getting today is, is a work in progress. We have everybody uh, gathered uh, and we prepped them in the same way that you were prepped as to how one of these expert guided sessions worked. Uh, they saw the people up in Bluff, as you can see on the screen here. Um, and we looked through those maps, but their task was to uh, work with a set of maps that we'll look at, uh, at in more detail in just a few minutes. We, we started the day out with this uh, agenda. So we had people subdivide into smaller groups. So they often had more expertise in a particular area. So folks who knew the Verde area to the north or the lower Gila, um, the central Hohokam area or the Mugion area up to the uh, east were separated out into, into groups. We had lunch together. We spent the full afternoon um, all focused on uh, making maps. And ground rules, we tried to keep people uh, <clears throat> civil um, and talking uh, one person at a time. And uh, it actually worked pretty darn well. So I think um, you get a, enough people together with a common set of interests and, and uh, so far, my experience, I don't want to ruin my luck, but so far the experience has been that people uh, behave reasonably well. So it's nice to know that can happen. So this is some of the breakout groups. Um, this is the group talking about Ho'okam. We had probably the most people in that group. Um, the folks uh, addressing the Magillon area uh, had their maps out. They were <clears throat> scratching them and talking about them over in, in their separate corner of the room. And then we brought people together to start really make, making maps. So we had done from Archaeology Southwest's staff a set of draft maps of how and cut things up into time periods. So I'm just going to show you four of the time periods of, of interest up there because they're more dynamic and and uh, they make uh, sort of points about some big things happening in the, on the landscape there. But so this was this, the map that we started with and it was projected up on the screen at the front of the room and in the back of the room uh, was the computer uh, graphics person who actively modified these maps or marked them up as we were uh, talking about them. So that map was modified with extensions and there were notes taken so that every line on here has uh, a set of notes as to what the heck it means and who made the comment as to why we should add or move a, a line and put it in a different place than it was on the original map. So, so this process was um, repeated for each of these time periods on each map. This marked up map, our, our map specialists had the time available to turn it into a new finished map. So we go from um, the marked up map to the near finished. Um, we will continue to work on these and run them out to people again for, for comment um, as to did we get it right, uh, that, that sort of thing. So it, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. But so this is the era when the Hohokam ball court world is pretty much uh, at its peak. Uh, you can see that brown area in the center uh, and extending out the, the yellow is, is kind of a um, less intense um, area of, of ball courts and so on. So we've marked that coherent hole with the yellow and brown colors. Um, 
The Mimbres area over in southwestern New Mexico is also thriving at this time. And the Patayan there in the west is, is again, uh, largely concentrated or most intensively concentrated along the rivers. A really interesting thing, if you look at both the Gila Bend area, um, and, which would be right in there, if that arrow is showing up for you, or the Safford area, um, these are places where in Gila Bend you've got Patayan and Hoakam overlapping. And the same thing is happening with Hoakam and <coughs> uh, the Mimbris over in the Safford area. So I'll come back um, in particular uh, to the Gila Bend area, but that how boundaries um, are formed and how what happens in those boundary areas is, is an interesting um, element of, of this process. So we'll move on to the very next time period. So from 1075 to 1130, quite a bit has happened. So you've still got Mimbris um, going on over in, in uh, southwestern New Mexico. Um, but the Hoakam ball court world has pretty much um, broken up in that time period. So we don't have a good explanation for what happened to, for all that to, to change relatively rapidly after about 300 years worth of, um, of effectively integrating this large area. Uh, we see a fairly rapid uh, decline in the, the Hoakam ball court system. And so again, the, the dynamics uh, start to show up. Uh, very intriguingly, there's, there are some ball courts, though, that do seem to continue on later up in the Flagstaff area. Um, and some of those are probably established even after the uh, eruption of Sunset Crater up in, in that area. So um, a, a different little kind of lagging phenomenon up there in the Flagstaff area. So we've jumped from that uh, 1130 time period over 100 years uh, forward. And again, another very dynamic time. In the Hoakam region, the, the brown is highlighting the Hoakam platform mound world. And it's at its pretty much maximum extent at this point. You've got um, platform mounds have, have um, been the focus of, of communities over in the, in the uh, Tano Basin around uh, Lake Roosevelt. Um, you've got them over on the San Pedro River, the lower part of the San Pedro, and down in Tucson. And even out in the eastern Papagoria, the area around Kitt Peak west of, of Tucson has, a, has several clusters of, of little platform mounds out in that area. So th that um, platform mound world extends out at that time. Moving over a little bit to the right on the map, you see this Cayenta migration. This is the main time in the history that we're, we're going to cover today when you have a significant population movement from outside the, the Gila River um, watershed into the interior. And it's all tied into the um, abandonment of the, the Four Corners area by the agriculturalists up in, in that area by about 1275, 1280. And some of those folks are, are uh, staying up in the Little Colorado area. Others are, are moving down into places like Grasshopper, Point of Pines, uh, the area around Safford, the Globe area, um, and even getting down into the San Pedro River Valley uh, east of, of Tucson. So we've highlighted those places where the Cayenta migrants uh, basically landed and, and uh, lived in, in uh, enclaves as uh, purple triangles on the map there. So there actually may be um, some relationship between the things going on in that Hoakam world and this um, Cayenta migration and in, in the Mugion um, areas that they're, they're landing in. The movement of population, um, what you see in most of these places is um, the platform mounds are pulling people together in more aggregate, aggregated communities. Um, they're, uh, I think, a response to 
a more formalized community structure, a more hierarchical uh, community structure. And we see on the landscape that the first response of to this movement of migrants into places that are already have resident populations is one of each sort of highlighting their own identity. So the, the Cayenta folks um, make their rather bold pottery and sort of show their identity through that. The, um, we see it most clearly on the San Pedro where the folks who are the current residents um, make a very bold San Carlos red on brown pottery with, the, with bold designs. So each of them are, are uh, sort of highlighting their, their differences, their uh, moving into places that are more readily defensible. So it's, there's a, a real sense of discomfort when you look um, at how people are positioning themselves and organizing themselves on that landscape early on in that, that migra migration sequence. Um, so let's move forward to the next um, time period. And there's some fairly significant change in a relatively short time. So that people being organized in opposition to one another and emphasizing their, their differences ceramically in particular is fairly quickly overcome. And we refer to this as the um, emergence of Salado as a new uh, religious uh, ideology that, that is an ideology of inclusion so that people who were uh, Cayenta could be, you know, Cayenta Salado. People who were um, Hohokam could be Hohokam Salado. So you didn't have to give up your, your heritage altogether. You could subsume it under this larger uh, kind of uh, overarching uh, ideology. And I made the point earlier that the Hohokam platform mound world is a much more hierarchical. You see people um, residentially living on high, higher grounds. There's, there's um, some of the compounds that, that are on in a community will have a platform mound. Others will just have a compound. Uh, so there's, there's kind of an architectural social differentiation. Um, and Lewis Bork um, has argued that who was, was a uh, preservation fellow with Archaeology Southwest sees the, the development of Salado and, it, and actually its expansion as appealing to people's um, kind of, or their resistance to the hierarchy that's, that's of the, the platform mound world. So it's a much more egalitarian approach. You see the, the Salado polychrome pottery, the fancy multicolored uh, pottery that, that becomes dominant at this time. It's actually widespread through, uh, so everyone has access to it. Um, it's uh, probably um, <clears throat> focused on communal feasting as, as a key way to integrate communities. And slowly that, that spreads across the landscape and moves. You can see it here. It's, it's a, sort of an Eastern and a Western um, element of, of Salado. Uh, and it doesn't displace people, but it does move more into the uh, Hohokam platform on world as an alternative way of, um, of ideology and, and focus um, for, for communities. So let me just sort of back up and remember what Barnaby Lewis was saying um, earlier on. Um, this, his comment in that quotation saw Cayenta as being uh, something that was given priority in sort of interpreting the archeology span of, of this landscape down here. And I think what we're trying to highlight here though is the Cayenta folks who lived up 
uh, farther north, had uh, different lifeways, came down, and it was the actual interaction and um, integration of these outsiders with local groups that brought about the emergence uh, of this new religious um, ideology. So it's it was not that they had a religion up there, brought it down and passed it out, or and somehow conquered people. It was something, it was a new emergent ph ph phenomenon uh, that w was uh, developed here in the Southern Southwest. So um, it is something which is showing um, direct engagement by both sides of that, that equation. And it took one to two generations for that to happen. So it is something that is, um, at least as we envision it now, is much less dependent on the Kayenta descendants from moving it around as it is just a, a sort of a contagious uh, spread of, of an ideology across the landscape. So um, offsetting that perspective that, that um, Barnaby was uh, complaining about or, or calling to our attention, let's say. Um, another interesting, um, going back to, to the Gillespie, or excuse me, the Gila Bend area and that overlap of Patayan and uh, Hoakam in that part of the world. So I'm going to focus first on this uh, using still the, the uh, Great Bend of the Gila proposed national monument as the base map there. Uh, I'm going to focus on the, the Gillespie Dam Narrows up there and the petroglyph uh, sites that are in that area. And the rock art there is a, it's a blend or a mix of, uh, as a mix of uh, Hoakam and Patayan. We don't have a precise tally of how they, they balance out, but it, there's a predominance of Patayan petroglyphs in that, that area. And you can see here in these two um, really um, outstanding glyphs, which are, are uh, I wish we had a person in there as they're almost, they're life size in terms of if a person was standing next to the archer that's on the, on the right there, who is, has his arrow and bow um, directed at the uh, sheep on the, the left there. And both of them have been pecked over by very geometric elements. So there's, there's a, a layering there on that. Um, so you're seeing um, different layers even in the in the rock art in this area and so again some some um, these would i think be pretty widely recognized as as Patayan, uh rock art elements uh, another set of the panels there that are uh, again a diverse mix but a, a fairly strong uh, representation of, of Patayan elements there so this area um, again sees an initial Hoakam uh, dominance and then a later uh, Patayan um, dominance in the, in the rock art. And that's, again, there's a, a gradual shift upstream in that area of this Patayan uh, identity and, and uh, material um, culture on, on the landscape. So you are seeing a little bit of a, a movement into that Gila Bend area over time. And it gets more intriguing as you look at the early historic maps uh, that have been, or the, if you make maps out of the early historic documents, let's put it that way. Um, so we were just looking at the um, circled area in terms of where the rock art it was located. But <clears throat> these dots on the, uh, are settlements that early visitors um, notated and described uh, along that stretch as they, they went through there. Uh, so all of the green dots are pipash, or the are human speakers. And you'll see that roughly from where a little bit west of Gila Bend and westward, all those are pure um, pipash uh, settlements. When you get into the orange area, 
of dots around Gila Bend uh, there at the lower right. Those are actually described as, as settlements where the people living there were bilingual. Uh, they spoke both the Autumn language and the, the uh, human language, or Pipash. And then the one solid red there um, is a, an Autumn village. And you notice that there's a, a note of the Komatki Trail heading off towards the east from there. And so this is a map, um, again, that goes from the Gila Bend area over to the Gila River Indian community area. And that Komatki Trail has been documented by um, Andy Darling, Sunday Iselt, and, and uh, Barnaby Lewis as a place on the ground um, in several locations, both over in the Sierra Estrellas on the east and uh, over in the Maricopa Mountains on the west. And that area of the Maricopa Mountains is now the Sonoran Desert National Monument. And so Aaron Wright, who gave the talk here uh, two months ago when we were last up here in Phoenix, has worked and uh, done about 80 acres, 80 acres, 80, 80 linear miles of surveys along roads out in the, the Sonoran Desert National Monument. And that area um, along the Komatki Trail, where there, there's a, a series of trails c converging, he's been able to document uh, in pretty intensive detail the kinds of artifacts that are occurring along that trail surface. And that trail has pottery that goes back to around 800 AD, and it has all subsequent time periods up through the, the 1400s. And that trail is still part of the uh, so-called oriole cycle uh, of, of songs that the Gila River Indian community, uh, Barnaby Lewis has um, talked about that. So this is something that goes, has about a thousand years of um, connecting the Gila area with the, uh, excuse me, the, the, the autumn area with the um, Patayan area down to, down to the west. So again, I think as these relationships across these boundaries um, are further explored, these ideas of uh, long-term relationships between the uh, folks living along the Gila and in the um, Hoakam area and the Patayan area, that those are going to actually argue for stability in that autumn presence in the, in the, the Hoakam area. So, um, and I think that there's other, um, Brett Hill, who was formerly um, worked with us back in the early 2000s, um, has re recently written a book uh, from Huugam to Hoakam, um, and in talking with Paul and Susie Fish has used the phrase that more and more archeologists are using the, instead of questioning whether there's a, a uh, continuity between what archeologists see as the Hoakam archeological pattern and the modern autumn people, there's more and more of a, um, consensus towards assumed continuity across that, that uh, time frame. And I think the kinds of information that's emerging as, as, as there's more and more studies like this is going to make that evidence uh, not even necessary to make it an assumption um, that it's going to strengthen that uh, relationship. What I've you know, been trying to highlight here or share here um, is a work in progress. Um, this mapping of the, the Gila, a, a lot of the goal is to put it into, to provide a context for the public lands of the, the um, greater Gila watershed. We've only highlighted really the um, places that are monuments and parks, national monuments and national parks in the map so far, but there's a whole, um, there's a great deal of both uh, Forest Service and uh, BLM land that is not 
uh, currently under uh, special status that is part of the public lands of, of the, the greater Gila. And the process of communicating across um, A, among archaeologists, and B, between archaeologists and, and uh, tribes is extremely important. It's been a, it's a, there's been a, well, the, I've been active in archaeology here for on the order of 40 years, and the ways in which archaeologists and, and uh, tribal members interact has changed dramatically over that time period. And I think it's changed uh, particularly rapidly in the last uh, decade or two. And so that, that kind of, there's increasingly collaborative research, um, communication, because archaeologists come at these things with a different um, a approach and point of view. Um, communication is often difficult to cross those lines, but I think it's, it's imperative that we continue those kinds of conversations and uh, that we carefully listen to uh, what our Native colleagues have to, to say about things as well. And as we use this information to advance the protection of our, our public lands, Casa Grande Ruins National Monument was established. It was the first federal archaeological preserve in the United States. It was established in 1892, just 480 acres. It's still pretty much the same size. It's had a couple of tiny tweaks to its boundaries over time. There will be a bill entering into uh, the House of Representatives relatively near uh, time to expand Casa Grande, to include the site of Adamsville, which is on state trust land a couple miles uh, to the east, and to put it into a, a bigger context um, than it, than it uh, is in, in its currently uh, relatively contained 480 acres there. Similarly to, you'll see very soon a bill to protect the and, and uh, pass, uh, hopefully, the uh, Great Bend of the Gila National Monument. You can see here in this landscape view and another view at, down at the at ground level uh, of that. So these are um, some of the ways in which this broader contextual information that um, the, we're in the process of trying to synthesize by bring, bringing together archaeologists um, and tribal folks in a session like we had a week ago uh, will be used to advocate for uh, specific things like this and broader uh, protections in the future, like getting more uh, funding for law enforcement related to our public lands. They, there's very little in the way of, of uh, actual, there's laws to protect things, but there's very few uh, law enforcement personnel to actually get out there and, and help make that happen. So, so these are the, some of the goals that we have in terms of trying to carry this information forward. And with that, um, I think Linda Pierce has a microphone and there's going to be the ability to uh, ask questions. And because I always forget something at the beginning of a, of a talk like this, um, the Smith Family Fund, uh, Foundation or Fund, um, sorry, Trust. Yeah, it's on the first slide, it's, I can read it, but uh, Trust um, is uh, they're really important. Um, supporters of, of this uh, opportunity to make these kinds of um, talks uh, available to people for free. Um, and the Arizona Humanities is the other um, partner that, that makes these uh, possible. So thank you, Smith family. And Okay. Um, so if you have any questions for Bill for a little bit, I'll bring the mic to you so we can get your question on the video. Did I hear correctly that you said uh, Meteor Crater happened in somewhat near time frame of Sunset a lot Crater. Of sunset, sorry, yes. Sunset Crater. That was an eruption. Um, and there's been some debate over the, it's, it's sort of long had a date of 1066, but there's another research which would push that date a little bit later in time, maybe into the 1080s or even 1090s, which 
um, even at the 1066 uh, date, um, seeing it's the eruption of that volcano that put the, the ash layer out uh, east of Flagstaff there and caused people to leave because uh, they couldn't farm in that, that area for um, a, a period of time. But to see ball courts established up there uh, post-eruption would put them pretty late in time relative to what's happening down here. So yeah, Meteor Crater is a different story. <laughs> Actually, mine's more of a comment. Ellie and I, and maybe some other people in here, participated in the recent archaeoastronomy conference up in Flag. And it was a unique experience because, again, there were uh, highbrow uh, astrophysicists mixed in with representatives of several tribes. And it was a very neat sharing experience. And personally, I like it, and I hope we can continue with this. And but it was, it was rather special. And the other thing that I pushed for is more books for children. Because kids get curious, third, fourth, fifth grade, and there's almost nothing written on their level. In archaeology, in rock art, in uh, astronomy, there's nothing. And that's when they're the most curious. So I would push for that here, that maybe we consider something uh, geared to children. No, we won't disagree. Um, we put our efforts into um, adult audiences and with our magazine, but recognizing that um, archaeologists have need help in writing to particularly the young audience, and that's a really critical element. We Any more questions for Bill? There's got to be something more to challenge him about. I was just going to ask about, um, my late brother had been a wildlife manager of Robins Butte Wildlife mm -hmm. Area with the, the Arizona Game and Fish, and I'm just wondering, I, I got to go up on top once, and they've got all the little holes in there, I guess the, pe the mm -hmm. women would gossip, what, I don't remember. Um, but is that all BLM land, uh, the, the like the Buttes, Powers Butte and Robins Butte? There's, well, it, the majority of those peaks are, yes, are BLM, and mm -hmm. each of them has uh, things on the top. There's places where they're using that volcanic, um, the rock there to make probably manos and matates. So there's yes. there's quarrying going on there. And then there's the um, mortars where they're pounding up the probably the mesquite pods. So lots of activity around that area. Thank you, I just, I, I, I was excited to see Robins Butte Powers Butte and Gillespie, Gillespie Dam because I've been to all those yeah. places. But the with Robins Butte, the last time I was out there was in the month of July, and it, some of our funders wanted to go up and see that, so we did it. We had the most remarkable experience. There were seven bighorn sheep that that as we were starting to come down, just paraded across, and then they they actually started to freak me out because they were they were curious and they were actually coming toward us <laughs> and, and i was glad that i was like the third person in line not <laughs> but no there was really um I, I think our funders truly love us because we gave them such a wonderful experience there <clears throat> i have two questions first off you're making a very articulate case with archaeologists and Native Americans about defending bear ears and other places. Is there anybody in the Trump regime who listens to you? And my second question is, I used to work out on the Gila River community as a home health nurse, and I know that some of the people out there did accept, you know, blood tests and all of that. So your diplomatic efforts to prove that there's continuity between the Holcom and the Odom, are any of them willing yet to have genetic testing done that would prove their point and strengthen their case? Well, there's, there's generally, I'll start with your last question first. Um, and so in, in general, there's a uh, pretty strong aversion to destructive um, 
treatment of human remains. So, so establishing a an ancient sample would is really not very um, easy at this point, or probably is not even possible. So, so there's a big question problem there. A lot of the way of treating the dead was through cremation, which is another um, element that would create, you know, create I issues with ancient DNA and so on. So. Um, I wouldn't see that as a very likely near-term um, direction that, that research would go. Um, and in terms of, I don't think that there's, well, I, I, I like, we, we've spent a good deal of time, um, you know, back in Washington, D.C., talking to people. Um, there's still some really, um, hard-working, caring people in the federal bureaucracy who they kind of have to keep themselves a little low. Um, but there are good people there that do listen. Um, they don't have a lot of power. Um, and it's ultimately, I think, going to be the courts that um, this is a really pretty, it's boiled down to a pretty simple legal issue and it, it applies to both Grand Staircase Escalante uh, and Bears Ears. Uh, both were established by uh, presidential proclamations under the Antiquities Act, and <clears throat> both were downsized um, by using the Antiquities Act. And legal scholarship is pretty strong and clear that uh, a president has, a, has been given the right by Congress to established national monuments. There isn't any explicit or even implicit um, ability to you know, downsize them or, or eliminate them. So it's, that's really the core um, issue. So the courts are gonna be the, thing, the uh, place where th these decisions get made. So thank you for the question. Great information, thank you very much. Um, I was interested in, in uh, copies of the maps that you had. I don't know if you're willing to give those. <clears throat> but um, I had a correction for you. Um, I'm Maricopa, or Pipash. The, the correct pronunciation of Pipash is not Pipash, ah. it's Pipash, it's just so everybody knows. In Maricopa, it's Pipash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, the accent is usually on the, the last syllable. Mm -hmm. Thank very you. Maricopa language. Right. But, but yeah, I, I would. <laughs> I'd love to get the, the maps, and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. So these maps will ultimately, again, they'll be um, proofed and modified uh, another round or two. Um, so we're, our plan is to work on an issue of our Archaeology Southwest magazine that focuses on the, the public lands of the Greater Gila and features these maps in various ways. And um, we'll definitely make these very available. So, well, thank you folks for your kindness and. <laughs> <laughs>